Um, there have been a number of speakers today who've talked about um, the concept of things like data-driven design and uh, monitoring, measuring things like ROI and, you know, contagion in particular, or not contagion, but uh, congregate in particular, put up a definition of a whole bunch of KPIs that they use. Um, and, but what has been glossed over so far and hasn't been talked about much is how you actually implement uh, good analytics tools and then how you use that information to actually affect your service design and operations. And um, for those of you who already have a game that's live, um, you know how much work goes into that. It's not particularly exciting sometimes uh, compared to talking about things like game design or real-time events. Um, but it does become a very important part of your day-to-day -day operations and thinking uh, once you've got your game live and you have user data flowing in and you're actually trying to figure out how to move the needle on some of those KPIs. And to that end, I'd like to introduce Elvin Lee from Sagamo, who's going to talk a little bit about um, dissecting user behavior, measuring and dissecting user behavior, and then doing something with it. Come on up on stage. All right. Thank you very much, David. Can I have a warm welcome for Elvin Lee, please? Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. I am Alvin. Um, I basically run a startup analytics company called Sogamo. Um, primarily what we actually do is that we pick up data from games and we analyze them and figure out for a game developer or publisher what they can potentially do to better monetize their users. So for my presentation today, I will be showing you um, one, how we actually dissected um, the game pl gameplay or game mechanics of Candy Crush. And at the same time, uh, after that, I'll actually be presenting to you on a case study that we, act we, we did it in-house with another game developer on how he used uh, what we actually have to improve his um, virtual, um, improve his uh, virtual goods monetization. So to kick off the entire presentation, basically is that how do, we act, how do we define user gaming behavior? That's a very critical question everybody has been asking. How do you actually know um, what do you categorize a user as? Are you going to categorize a user as a killer in an MMO game, MMORPG game? Are you going to categorize a user as a socializer in a uh, Facebook game? How are you going to do all that with, without having tools to figure out and help you understand the data set that's actually coming in from your games. So everybody really wants to find out, first things first, how do you need to study these users and then go forward, uh, use this information, figure out, okay, this my KPI is going to be um, getting 100 bucks from this user over the next 12 months. How are you going to do that? How, how are we going to turn that data to be helpful for you? So we, we, we all have been trying to figure out as game developers or publishers, how, 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 what's that magic to figure that all out? So just to give you a very general guideline on how game design, uh, uh, what game design actually encompasses, especially for Facebook or um, any, any other platform games, is that we have a bunch of features that we need to take note of. First things first would be you need to know, you need to create a game that has a gameplay design, right? So you need to be able to figure out what kind of actions are actually occurring within the game itself. On top of that, you need to figure out how your people, how your gamers, are coming in from a, uh, from a marketing perspective. Are they coming in from advertisements uh, using Google, Google AdWords, or are they coming in from advertisements you posted in other platforms, right? And on top of that, you also have to figure out key critical actions in within your game space itself. Like for example, how, how are you sending your messages to your users? How do you actually encourage them right, to come back and say, hey, I really feel like playing this game today, right? So, what, what are the messages that triggered that thought in, inside them? Right? So these, these are things that you have to figure out. Then at the last, but most importantly, 
you as a game developer or publisher, you have to figure out how you're going to turn this into a viable business because end of the day, uh, we have to put food on the table. So we, we, we have to put all this data together to figure the business model out of the entire thing. So first things first would be this. For the kind of tools that are available out there, there's tons of them. Um, it's not only just us. There's uh, probably 20 or 30 other competitors out there presenting to each and every one of you game developers a set of tools that you can potentially use to monetize your game. So there's a lot of talk recently about people giving you this kind of tool called big data, big analysis tools out there to collect huge forms of data, uh, terabytes of data on a daily basis for you, for you to be able to figure out and analyze later on. But one, thing's the, the one thing that has been actually stopping us, a lot of us, from using all these big data tools out there is, is very, very simple, down to the basics. We don't understand how to use this tool at all, let alone figure out how to analyze it. So that's why, that's why for, for us, we really have to spend a ton of time trying to figure out or maybe get a consultant or some analyst to figure out how to turn all that huge data down to gold, right? So just to give you a quick view, overview of what are the available tools out there, these are, every, these are most of the tools that are, I would say, more successful in the industry right now that you could potentially make use of. Um, if you really want to find out about all these tools later on, my slides will be posted online. Every, every, anyone, you can, you can just look at the slides later on. So um, my focus today is to bring out this story that we are talking about, which is Candy Crush. Why is it so successful right now in the industry? Everybody is talking about it. Everybody is playing it. Everybody is playing it on their way to work. Everybody is playing it af before they go to bed. Everybody seems to like this game, but there's a catch in their design that is actually based on data that nobody knows about. Or probably the guys who run the company, they know about it. But for us normal people out there, we don't know about. So i like to kick off this story with this. There, there was a YouTube video that came out um, about three months ago stating that Candy Crush is evil. Uh, why is Candy Crush evil? Because it's such a casual, low-commitment kind of puzzle game that makes you so addicted towards playing it. And it's actually dramatized in this YouTube video. You can copy the link and watch it later on. But what basically the underlying story of this video was, it was saying that Candy Crush, basically, it's so easy for you to play. It, it, it's uh, very easy for you to pick up anytime, as and when you want to. And to the extent where it becomes part of your everyday life, that whenever you feel like picking up your phone, you, the first thing you would actually open up in, as an application would be Candy Crush. So it's that, it's that addictive, I would say. So what, what, who are these guys, or who are, what, what's Candy Crush uh, main target market to kick off with in the, in the first place was that they were targeting the persona of casual gamers. People who are very stressed or uh, very time stressed, I would say. They, they basically figure, they were basically people who are potentially mothers or people who are of the slightly mid, middle aged generation where um, they have an orientation around the family, right? The only time, the only time these women have would be to when, when they're on their way to work or potentially when they're not looking after their kids, they would take out the phone to play the game. So these, these group of players look at games that are, would say, require short attention span. And at the same time, uh, they also like to connect with their, with their friends and, every, uh, and everyone else around them. So Candy Crush sort of plays upon this behavior where basically it, it solves the needs of the persona of a casual gamer, of a, a lady who is in the mid, mid, 
mid, uh, middle age, I would say. Okay, so where are people playing Candy Crush or playing, um, playing casual games? On a mobile phone, you will notice most of the time um, spent on playing casual games is when before you go to bed. And 31% of the people that were surveyed for this particular survey was that 31% of these people play their games while in bed and while they're on the bus or, the tra uh, or, or on, um, spend the majority of their time on the bus and train playing these games. So basically, if you were to map this out from a data perspective, how will it actually look like? You would potentially see spikes in your graph where at night, probably between 8 to 10 p.m., there is, uh, or maybe 12 p.m., there's a huge spike in playing a game. Right, and potentially the sessions, the number of sessions that are running through during this time period is huge. Whereas while, while throughout the rest of the day it's relatively low, on, but it will only be potentially high when in the morning, say between 8 to 10 a.m. when people are actually rushing to work, you'll see a, another spike over there. So that's how, that's how you look at it from a data perspective, where data tells you from a time from a time st from a standpoint of the time you spend on an entire day, where potentially these fights are, where you spend most of your time playing a game. So the good thing, the good news is that because the game is short, you can play anywhere, right? Social games, mobile games, you can practically play it every day. So that's where the Candy Crush design sort of help the. Uh, the game become viral because you play it, you can play it almost every single day. Right. The other addictive element in Candy Crush itself is that this is very competitive. I think all of you who have played Candy Crush before, you probably understand. Um, you are trying to take over, overtake, and your friends out there who have been at specific levels in Candy Crush. And what, what? everybody likes within this game design is that there's a challenge over there and it makes use of data again right it's presenting to you the facebook data where your friends are are your potential com are your competitors and you from a from a player standpoint the data feeds is is fed to you from um, telling you who is much higher than you so what you are what you're actually trying to do over here would be to buy, overtake the other person. But then, um, from time to time, when you do overtake another person, it does show you a sort of a screen that comes out and say, hey, congratulations, you have beat somebody else. So always from a data perspective, we are trying to map out different, different progress of every single person and, say, and, and use, it as a, uh, use it as a tool where you would challenge a person to, uh, to, to play as much as possible to get to a level high as, uh, as high as possible and beat everybody else in their network of friends. So this is purely a data push from them. Right. On top of that, um, these guys also f uh, focus a lot of effort on um, pushing people to buy stuff. Right. And again, from a data perspective, it's a challenge. So the challenge they propose over here would be this. If you are lacking in terms of skill, right? so they, make, they try to push the bell curve of, um, getting, uh, of playing the game lower right? by, by, by asking people potentially if you want to buy certain items, for example. Right? It will help you play your game much faster. This, this, this is everything. This is everything in which the uh, game orientates around. So basically, if you buy stuff, you get your progress faster. You, you have a leverage over some, you have a competitiveness over somebody else. Okay, but what we do not know over here is that from a, from a data perspective, these guys played very well by segregating it into two types of transactions. As you can see in the screen over here, there is two types of pricing. One is a micro pricing, 
One is a uh, start of a bigger transaction ranging from 16 to 30, 39.99. So they understand very well from the data perspective. There are actually two groups of play, uh, two groups of payees in the game itself. There are some people who are comfortable with pulling out their their credit card and say, "Hey, uh, let me do a 50 cent or one dollar purchase right now because it's very easy for me to do so." Right? There's another group of players where they can potentially say, "Hey, I do not want to just put a dollar or or two dollars right now. I want to just put a huge amount and." settle the rest of my problems for the next 10 days or 15 days for example so they understand very well from a data perspective these two groups of payees and that's how they actually position pieces of the game in front of you where you could you could buy something small you could buy something much bigger <coughs> okay so the next thing why the uh, where um, why we say that candy crush is evil is that um, it's very infectious in a way where they do a trade-off, right? For for from from a gamer a, a game publisher or developer's perspective, you see a wide range of players. There are people who play forever but never pay. There are people who do pay a little. There are people who do pay a huge ton of money, right? So how do they actually do a trade-off? with the people who do not actually pay at all. So what they did over here was that they asked you as a gamer to infect your other friends. So infecting, infecting other friends to be Candy Crush players, right? Where, where if you're short of lives in your game, uh, ask, ask someone else to join the game, give you a life. That, that's how they actually do it. And again, from a, from a data perspective, um, you wouldn't know this. At all. You wouldn't know this uh, this fact if not if they haven't published like many other games before. So gradually, as a learning process, they saw this. They saw this pattern. They implemented something like that. Okay. So what these these guys did very well was that these guys they learned how to play with users. I was playing with users, meaning that. They know how to manage fun pretty well, right? Understanding when you would actually resist them as a game publisher and when you would not resist them. So resisting would mean, hey, I, I come to a point where I am too irritated. I don't want to play this game anymore. So because for simple reasons, uh, you have been asking me to buy stuff over and over and over and over again, and I don't like to see those kind of stuff. So they, they have specific data sets where they help figure out, okay, I know this person is getting irritated soon, right? So I have an alert in the game itself to say, hey, don't ask this user for pain. Don't, don't ask this user to pay me anymore because I know this person is not going to fall for that trick, right? So they have played this uh, pretty well. It's actually built into the game itself. And on top of that, uh, if you do play Candy Crush again. Uh, their difficulty level, it's uh, almost the same as what we are showing over here. Um, initially, it's very simple, then gradually it becomes difficult, and then it becomes simple again, and then it becomes more difficult again. For very simple reasons, uh, is to manage attention span of people. Because as you as a game developer, you wouldn't want to make your game so challenging that throughout the entire 12 months or 10 months this person has been playing this game is always very exciting. Right? It is exciting, true enough, but it only works for hardcore gamers. Uh, casual gamers from time to time do not want to be overstressed. So you do not want to design your game in such a way where you're always stressing the player at every single point of time. So this, this is how these guys are actually doing it. Then, um, the most important thing is that these guys, what they did was that they have means to track actions in your game. So from a data perspective, what they are trying to do, every single thing you have been trying to do in your game, every single click, every single uh, trigger you have done in your game, it's all being tracked and then stored in their database 
for them to process a map like this. So what this map essentially tells you is a process flow of a specific gamer. So how would you actually make use of a process flow of a of this of a gamer? Um, for one very simple way of actually using it is to for you to figure out at which particular points of this process that a person would most likely give up and say, hey, I don't want to play a game anymore. That's the easiest way for you to look at it, right? So take an action at, at, spe at a specific point and say, if I notice this specific, this, this particular player is going to leave the game soon, maybe give him an incentive of, uh, hey, I have 10, uh, 10 more currencies to give you today just, for, as, just an, as, as an offer or of a way of me saying thank you for playing the game for like the past four months, for example. So there are, there are specific incentives where you drive, where you push it straight, you push it directly to the game developer to take action upon. So I would want to run through with you on a very simple case study that we, we did for this game called Mighty Dungeons. So we help Mighty Dungeons analyze what um, they as a, uh, you as a player would, uh, would do in the game itself. And from there we triggered sort of a targeted action to incentivize the user to stay longer. But for this case, uh, it's not only just staying longer. Our goal was to help Mighty Dungeons um, um, Get, get rid of as much in-game currency as possible because right now their core focus is to push in a new, car new game currency where they can monetize. So right now our key goal was that to, to exhaust as much current game currencies as possible for them as quickly as possible. So what we did over here was that uh, we used our tool to generate an action called Divine Intervention. So Sogamo, basically our tool, is now got in, in, in Mighty Dungeons. Uh, we, all, we trigger actions uh, based upon two methods. One is where you, as an RPG player, while running around the dungeon, uh, we notice that there's a potential for you to lose in the next battle. Then from what we do is that we will trigger this, game, this thing called Divine Intervention and say, God is trying to help you, right? We have an item to give you right now, but you have to trade it off with a couple of game currencies, right? So with that being said, right, uh, basically it encourages the user to spend the virtual currency at this point of time. So we, we did help achieve their KPI of our spending virtual currencies. And um, on top of that, it also gives the user a way of, um, it also, it, it's also a way of the game designer saying thank you to the, game, to the gamer, say, hey, I want to offer you something. So it's a, a two-way incentive, right? And on top of that, uh, we also created something called the shop highlighting effect, where we noticed that uh, for specific game gamers, there might be uh, items that are more tuned towards their gameplay. So we would want to take historical information we got from many other players out there, present it to the player by highlighting the item uh, you as a gamer you would potentially like. So if someone else has the same persona as you playing this specific game, we realize you match, it, you, you match his gaming behavior, we present to you what he has used before. So then we highlight it inside the shop. So all this actually plays upon, uh, plays upon having some understanding within the game itself. So for this case, we push virtual consumption rate as high as uh, 60%, but on average, uh, on average, it's about 40%. So all this basically plays upon this very simple method that we, we devise called collaborative filtering, using previous actions from other gamers and mapping that out against someone else now. So we take other, other stuff into consideration as well, um, like your context of your gameplay, what level you are at, what dungeon you are at, what actions have you have did in the past five seconds that would actually uh, show you that you would want to, show, uh, that would actually show that you would need this specific item right now. 
time. On top of that, we also figure out in terms of specific time in the day where you have where you are actually playing the game, where you are actually putting a lot of attention span or focus on. Right. For this case, uh, just just to show you a chart of a specific user, we realize that uh, his action action count within when he is actually playing a game on a Monday afternoon um, was exceptionally high. So it could be that during his lunch hours, uh, this person tends to like to play the game, and his action count was super high. It's reaching off peak. So as such. If we were to do a push or a push notification in the pop up in the divine intervention as we showed to you just now, there's a high chance for this person to say, Hey, I would just purchase this specific item that you presented to me. Uh, it's God's intervention. I will take it. <laughs> so that that's where that's where we were looking at. It's a it's a data point of view where where you're trying to push when you are trying to push incentives to someone, you have to know what context you are looking at, and you have to know when and what kind of activities rate they are facing at that particular time span, and if it's a comfortable time for you to push a specific event. So things like that have to be taken into consideration when you do incentives. So in summary, what we tried, what I've been trying to tell you for the past 20 minutes or so, is to help you figure out what you need to understand from gamers, right? You need to, for you to understand a gamer's behavior, you need to be able to understand what kind of, uh, what kind of features or what kind of designs are critical to your game and would be relevant to a player. On top of that, you also need to figure out from a data perspective what are the exit points for a specific user, right? So if you do understand that, you can fine-tune incentives to encourage people to stay on further, right? So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. I think we have a, an opportunity for one question. We have some time. Sure. Any questions for Elvin on his user behavior? Information. So, why don't you can can you talk a little bit about what Sakamo is and is it available for? Oh, for okay. Licensing. So, uh, currently, Sogamo it's a uh, online tool for you to be to for you to integrate your game uh, with us. Uh, we pick up data directly from um, the gamers itself. So, if you have an Android, iOS game, Flash game, or a Unity based game. We directly record data from the user at the user end and pick up the data from there and store it in our servers. And using that data, we, we do a prediction for whenever a user would potentially exit from your game and, and other stuff on top of that. So uh, we, we, do a, we do consultancy on top of that as well if needed, but primarily it's used as a tool for you as a game developer to visualize and understand your, your gamers better. Thank you very much, Alvin.